Hey, everybody. Um, we are here this year, again, doing our shoeboxes. Um, I wanted to just let you know, this is one of the things that we do every year with CAs. And even though uh, Children in Action is not meeting in person, uh, we are still uh, remotely learning uh, every single week we have a lesson going on and we're still doing the outreach program so we are so excited that we have so many shoe boxes to share um, especially now just to keep the program going even though it seems like a lot of other things are stopping um, so right now we want to go ahead and pray over these shoe boxes uh, before they take their journey so if you'll pray with me Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity that we get to um, have outreach so that we can tell other people about you. Um, we pray that you would just be with these shoe boxes as they travel, um, keep all of the volunteers safe, and just um, we pray that as each child receives their shoe box, they can just know you and, and let you come into their life and just share God with their family. In uh, Jesus' name we pray, amen. So good morning. How's everyone this morning? Good, good, good. So if you Y'all would, look good. <laughs> so they look good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's a couple of them. You know, there's a couple of them out there. Kind of questionable this morning, but you know what? We we'll, we take you as you are. So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, if we can get everyone to join us in standing as we sing our praises unto God this morning.
seated. All right. Uh, y'all, this might surprise y'all, but um, sometimes I screw up. Uh, <laughs> once or twice I have. and uh, maybe. 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 Once. My wife isn't here, so I can't, you know, she's not here to correct me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the past six months has been pretty crazy in my family. Uh, we've had a lot, of, a lot of ups and downs. It's been a roller coaster. And, uh, you know, it never fails. The, whenever my life becomes unstable like that, the first thing I do is I quit talking to God. Um, it's, it's what happens every, every single time. And that's what happened this time. Um, and it takes, it takes me sitting down and wanting to be back in his presence, wanting, to be, wanting him to be back beside me, wanting me to feel him, to, uh, to draw me back to where I'm supposed to be. Um, the, the Bible says over and over again that the, God's promise he'll never leave us and never forsake us. And... Uh, if that's true, he's always there. We're always in God's presence. Always. It takes us wanting to be on that level with him. Because he's already there. Uh, so, when we sing this today, if you know the words, please sing along. Um, if you just want to sit there and, and worship him in silence, that's, that's fine too. Just take this time to uh, prepare your heart and, and try, to be, uh, try to get on God's level. to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave I'm not here for blessings Jesus you don't owe me anything and more than anything that you can do I just want you I'm sorry when I just go through the motions I'm sorry when I just sing another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry when I come with my agendas 
I'm sorry when I forget that you're enough. Just take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in holy moment I never want to leave I'm not here for blessings Jesus you don't owe me anything and more than anything that can do I just want you I just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you nothing else Nothing else, nothing else will do. Cause I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. More than anything that you can do. I just want you. Father God, we just ask that you would fill this place with your presence. Lord, all we do is want to have an encounter with you this morning as your people gathered in this place to celebrate you. Lord, I pray your blessings upon all those that are watching online. I pray your blessings upon those who are, are here in person. I pray your blessings upon us, Lord, as we try to unify ourselves to the mission that you have called us to. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we pray that you would move in our midst this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to be in Psalm 133. Psalm 133. And as you're uh, Finding that on your apps and in your Bibles, I would encourage you, once you find it, to kind of look around the room and maybe wave at somebody. You don't have to say nothing. You can just wave at them. Tell them hi. Glad you're here. There you go. Very good, very good. Psalm 133. This is the final psalm of a a scent that we will talk about. It's uh, the songs that the Hebrew people would sing as they traveled up to Jerusalem, up to the temple, and they would sing these songs in lieu of their, or on their way to their, their festivals. So you can imagine thousands of people going up a mountain and singing these songs together and how that would just elevate your hearts as they were making their way to worship the God that created the heavens and the earth. And so our thesis statement throughout this series has been that we are modern day pilgrims. We are on a journey, a pilgrimage to heaven, and on our way there, we are being formed into the expressions of God's love that he wants us to be. In Psalm 121, we learned that we have a, a helper on the trails. We have someone that will make sure that we don't lose our traction, someone that will shelter us from storms. We have a God who will 
give us everything we need to rest, to Sabbath. In Psalm 130, we learned that God is completely unfair in the way that He treats us. He gives us things that we don't deserve. He doesn't give us what we do deserve. We talked about how that should inspire us to love people unfairly around us with that same love that God has shown to us, to give them grace and to give them mercy. We talked about last week in Psalm 128 that we have a secret to happiness, and that secret is if you love God and love your neighbor, then you will be blessed. You'll be blessed in your work. You'll be blessed in your family. You'll be blessed in your emotions. You'll be blessed in your community, and generation after generation will be blessed. And today, we're going to learn about a song that tells us that God values unity. God values unity. King David wrote this psalm, and he knew a lot about unity. He followed in the footsteps of King Saul. And King Saul was a very divisive king. He brought the, the nations together for a moment, and then he, the tribes scattered because he was such a divisive person. He, just, uh, he drove everybody apart. And so when David came into power, David's job, number one, was to bring all 12 tribes of Israel back together. And he did a good job of it for the most part. But near the end of his reign, uh, Jeroboam led a northern tribe re- uh, revolt against the southern tribes. And so they had a, a, a civil war. And then a few years later, Hezekiah found this psalm that David wrote during that time period. He found it out. It was in mothballs in the closet somewhere. And he, he found this psalm, all three verses of it, and he read it. And he said, this is exactly what we need to bring the nations back together, to bring the tribes, the people back together, to bring the, the north and the south to, together. And so he came up with a plan that would have the, the people meeting together again, and they would all sing this psalm together as they strove for unity. And so as we come to Psalm 133 this morning, I want us to ascend together in unity as we read it. Psalm 133 says, How delightfully good, how delightfully good when brothers and sisters live together in harmony. It's like a fine oil on the head running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard onto his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon falling on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has appointed the blessing, life, forevermore. Father, bless the reading of your word. I thank you for everyone that is here in this building today and everyone watching online, and I pray that you would inspire us all to be expressions of your love to the world around us, no matter where you take us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. E pluribus unum, what's that mean? One nation under God. It's the founding principle of the United States of America, the great melting pot that we are. And if we've learned anything throughout history, we've learned that unity is something that is extremely, extremely hard to attain. Our default mode is to trab up, to, to fracture, and then to trab up, and then to, to, to war with the, the other tribes. And especially in the, the church context, we see that happening. But I want you to know this morning that God values unity. Unity means that many come together to serve and to lead and to form and to act as one. And so God values that. In fact, God tells us that we should fight for unity. It's not something that we should just aspire to, but no, this is something that we should actually fight for. We should fight for unity. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 says, Above all, above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, says that we need to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Before Jesus went to the cross, he, he prayed to his Father. And if you're wondering what was on his mind, what was on his heart before he went to the cross, before he knew he was going to die, and so before he went to his death, this is what was on his mind, church unity. In fact, in John chapter 17, verse 11, we hear the words of Jesus In this prayer, he says, Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. He actually prayed that three times in that same prayer, that they be one as we are one. He's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how they are one, and he wants his church to be one, unified, the same way that he is unified with his Father and the Holy Spirit. But tragically, this is not the norm for our society, and it is definitely not the norm for our churches. In fact, Baptists are notorious for being divided. If you type in Baptist jokes in Google, like nine out of ten jokes have to do with how the Baptist church is divided. 
Um, for example, there was a, a Baptist, and he was stranded on an island for 20 years, and they finally got to him. The rescue workers got to him, and, and the, when they arrived, they saw that he had built three, stru- three structures on the island. And they asked him what the three structures were, and he said, well, that one over there, that one's my house. And they said, well, what about the second one? What is that? And he said, well, that's my church. I'm a Baptist, and so I value worship. And they said, well, what's this third one over here? And they said, well, that was my first church, but then it split, and I went to the other one. <laughs> Come on, that's funny. I got some more. Look, how many Baptists does it cha- take to change a light bulb? How many Baptists? We don't change. <laughs> that's good. Um, how many Baptists does it cha- take to change a light bulb? Well, it takes one to change the light bulb, and then it takes three committees to approve the change, and it takes another committee to bring the potato salad. All right, I'm done. Um, <laughs> man, I'm so bad at jokes. It's so sad. All right. So let's get back on track. We're going to talk to Rick Warren. Let's see what Rick Warren has to say. Bring some truth to us, brother. Uh, Rick says this about unity. He said, it is your job. Whose job? Your job. It is your job to protect the unity of your church. The unity of the church is so important that the New Testament gives more attention to it than either heaven or hell. God deeply desires that we experience oneness and harmony with each other. Unity and the soul of fellowship destroy it, and you rip out the heart of Christ's body. Man, destroy it, and you rip out the heart of Christ's body. That's some strong language, but friends, that's exactly how the Bible talks about fighting for unity. There's a passage of Scripture in Proverbs chapter 6 It's kind of a tough passage to read because it's all about the things that God doesn't like. It's just God doesn't like this, God doesn't like this, God doesn't like this. And so in that that chapter in Proverbs 6, verse 19, it says, God strongly disapproves of the one who stirs up trouble among the brothers. Strongly disapproves of the one who, who stirs up trouble among the brothers. Now, right before this, the two listed before this, one is murder, and the next one is lying under oath. So do you think God values unity? Absolutely. He makes strong statements throughout Scripture about it. John Phillips said, it being unity, unity is what Satan dreads and what he works night and day to undo. Unity is what Satan dreads and works night and day to undo. God wants what's best for us. He always wants what's best for us. And he says the best thing for us is to be unified. And that is why evil attacks your marriage, it attacks your school, it attacks your nation, and it attacks your church. Because it does not want you to be unified. So I ask myself, well, what are the, what are the pillars of unity? What, what does unity look like practically? And I came up with, with three and once you see the, the price tag for unity, you're going to get a little bit of sticker shock probably because it, it costs a lot to be unified. The first thing we see is that it takes humility to get to unity. It takes humility to get to unity. Humility is when you choose to set aside your pride and your, your big opinions and, and your, your must-haves. You, you set those at the door as you enter and you become a valuable part of something bigger than yourself. Now, please note that we're not talking about uniformity. Uniformity is when everybody talks the same, everybody looks the same, everybody dresses the same, and the Bible says nothing about that. God never says that we should be uniform. What he does say is that we should be unified. See, we need to take into account that people are are unique. How many of you know somebody that's (laughs) unique? It's a nice way of describing it, right? a lot of unique people out there in the world, and uniqueness, when it's accepted as a part of the the greater whole, it makes you corporately more powerful than you could ever be alone. You can do more together than you ever could apart. So there's no such thing as being a small part of a family, or being a small part of a church, or being a small part of an organization, because everybody is necessary for the greater good. The Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. It says, just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. He's talking about the church. He's talking about the church. So you got fingers and eyeballs and ears, and, and it all forms one body. And when any part of that is not working or missing, then the body is not as strong as it could be. And so every part of the body, according to God and his church, is, is a valuable member of, of the body. So God brought us all to this place at this time for this purpose, and we're all valuable in our own unique way. 
And the main thing that messes all of that up is what I said earlier, it's pride. Pride. It's when we think that our tastes are more important than someone else's. It's when we think that, that we are more important than someone else. It's when we fail to listen to what God has to say about loving our neighbor as much as ourselves or putting others' needs ahead of our own. It's when we fail to do that. It's when we start mansplaining stuff. My wife accuses me of that sometimes. Mansplaining. Like, she knows. She doesn't need me to tell her, but I, I explain it to her anyway like she doesn't understand. That's, that's pride. And what that does is it damages the bonds of, of unity. But if you're willing to see things from other people's perspectives, if you're willing to, to value their uniqueness, then you become more unified, more powerful. So the first thing you have to do if you want to be unified is you have to be humble. The second thing that we have to do is we have to be trustworthy. It takes trust to get to unity. We live in a very suspicious culture. We always think somebody's coming for our job or coming for our spot or coming to steal our shine. And so because of that, we are very much a people that do not trust. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 says, Love hopes all things. I get accused of this all the time. They, they say I live in ignorant bliss or I'm always seeing the best in people and when I shouldn't and things like that. But I do that because I believe in this verse. Love hopes for the best in all things. Love sees the best in all people. You don't dwell on their bad attributes. You, build, you dwell on what's good, what they can bring to the table, what they can offer. Stephen Covey in a wonderful leadership book called Speed of Trust he said, organizations go further and faster with high amounts of trust. And then he defines what that trust looks like. And he says, trust is built when people quickly and readily admit their mistakes. Trust is built when leaders make it okay to be vulnerable, like Jonah did for us. When they say, look, I've messed up and this is what God did for me. When leaders are vulnerable, trust is built when people are quick to ask for help. So if we want to be a church that is known for unity, we have to learn to trust one another. We have to be quick to say, hey, I messed up, forgive me. I'll work on it. We have to be quick to say that, to be vulnerable. We have to be quick to, to ask for help. And if we do those things, then we'll build trust and we'll be one of those successful organizations that God called us to be. Number three, it takes determination. So humility and trust are big, but it takes determination. It takes determination to get to unity. Nothing, nothing, nothing was ever accomplished by lukewarm people. Nothing. Revelation chapter three, verse 16 tells us what Jesus thinks about a lukewarm church, said, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Hmm. You have to be passionate. You have to be determined to fight for unity. Our natural state is chaos. It's fractions. It's disorder. It's tribes. That's our natural tendency. And so if you want to be a part of a church that is unified, if you want to be a part of a, a marriage, a family that is unified, if you want to be part of a, a school or a community that is unified, then you have to be determined to fight for unity. Let's go back to those two verses I read earlier. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. It says, above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You got to put it on. You got to wake up in the morning, and while you're brushing your teeth and you're looking in that mirror, you say, Today is the day that I'm going to put on love because my natural default state is not to love. I have to put it on. I have to make that effort to bring about love if I want unity in the place that I'm about to go. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, it said, Making every what? Making every effort. Effort means effort. It takes effort to get to unity. To build that bond of peace, it takes effort. We have to be intentional about what we are trying to do. You have to fight for unity. And then what I love about this psalm is it gives us the after effects of what happens. If you are willing to be humble, if you are willing to be trustworthy, if you are determined to fight for unity, then Psalm 133 tells you what you can expect out of life. And it's great, <laughs> It's the perfect life. Psalm 133, verse 1 says, How delightfully good when brothers and sisters live together in harmony. So if you are going to fight for unity, then you can expect the result to be the fact that life will become more enjoyable. Who wants a more enjoyable life? Raise your hand. All right, most of you do. Sorry about the ones that want to be miserable. But um, if you want a more enjoyable life, fight for unity. Because unity is life without friction. 
Now, it doesn't always mean that you'll be at peace. Jesus is very clear that we are sinners saved by grace. We are going to mess up. We're going to say the wrong thing. We're going to text the wrong thing. We're going to send the wrong email. We're going to go and get the pot stirred up so that people get upset. We're going to do that stuff that, because we're sinners and we mess up. But what happens after the sin, that's what matters. So if we're going to be unified, then when we fall, we have to then work to make it right. That's where harmony comes from trying to make things right when we mess up. And the way to do that is to view life through other people's eyes. This is one thing that I'm really, really intentional about in my own personal life. I want to know why somebody did what they did, and I want to know why somebody did not do what they did. So, or did not do what they didn't do. Because I want to understand them. Because I know that two people can walk up and see the exact same thing, walk into exactly the same situation, and when they leave, they can tell completely different stories about what they experienced in that moment, because people are unique. And so what I like to do is I like to figure out, well, why, why didn't they do that? Or why did they do that? That way I can relate to them and see the world through their eyes. So instead of building division, we're building bonds of unity. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 tells us that there's a cord of three strands and it's not easily broken. So if you and your boy or you and your girl, you're tight and then you have unity and all of a sudden this like third strand comes in, then you're almost unbreakable. But what the Bible is telling us is that third strand is Jesus. So you got you, you got your brother and sister in Christ and you come together and you're unified and then what's Jesus promised to do? He promises to show up too. So now you got that third strand, that third cord that makes you virtually unbreakable, especially when Jesus is there. I was reading about quartets and there's this thing called a a fifth man that happens sometimes when there's a quartet and they are just on point and they're feeling it and they're harmonizing and they take it to the next level and all four of them are in the zone, they talk about this fifth voice, this fifth voice that can be heard bringing their voices together in unity, allowing them to be even greater than they were, taking their their singing up a level. Friends, that's what we have in Jesus. When we are harmonizing, when we are unified, We have that fifth voice. We have that third strand. Jesus promises to come and and to make life more enjoyable. He adds that strength that we need to really be able to enjoy life, to take us up a level, to allow us to do amazing things. Whether it's in our marriage or at the company or at church, he allows those things to happen when we are harmonizing. Number two, we're promised that the group, the group, the organization becomes more capable. The church becomes more capable. Verse 2 says, it's like a fine oil on the head, running down on the beard, running down Aaron's beard onto his robes. Why are we talking about creepy, oily beards this morning? Well, if you wondered that, I did too, okay? And so I looked up what this oil and this beard thing was all about, and it took me to uh, Exodus chapter 30, verse 31, where God explains the source of this oil on the high priest Aaron's head. It says, this will be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It must not be used for ordinary anointing on a person's body, and you must not take anything like it, and you must not make anything like it using its formula. It is holy, and it must be holy. Holy means set apart. So it is set apart, and it must be set apart to you. He's talking about anointing, anointing oil that is only to be used for the high priest. So when Aaron was called to be the high priest, they anointed him with oil. And what that symbolizes is a new degree of service to the people. It's a, it's a new opportunity for Aaron to serve. And you'll notice in this verse 2 and verse 3 that, that God says the blessings flow from above, right? It flows down the beard. It flows down the mountain. Blessing starts with God and it comes to us. And what, this, what unity does is it is unleashes that blessing. So If we look at it this way, if there is discord, if there is dissent, if there is disunity, then God says you will stop being blessed. And don't we see that at churches? You drive by, you got this big building and like three cars in the parking lot. And I would venture to say, if you ask what happened, it'll come back to some form of discord or dissent or disunity. And what happens in those moments is God stops his blessing. It flows from above, but when there's not unity, he stops the blessing. 
And when he stops the blessing, there's no new opportunities. And the organization, the church suffers. But on the other side, on the positive side of things, if there's harmony and agreement and accord, then blessings will flow. New opportunities will open. And the church or your family, whatever, the, the group will be blessed. It unleashes this new capability that you didn't even know that was possible when you find unity. Nehemiah heard about the wall in Jerusalem and how it was destroyed. And when that happened, the, the Jewish people were spread all over the place. They scattered to the ends of the earth. And so Nehemiah wanted to go and rebuild the wall. And the first thing he did is he got the people back together. He brought them back as one, and they were able to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem because they were able to work as one. The people said, it's impossible. You'll never be able to do it. You don't even know how to build a wall. This can't happen. But what happened? They came together as one. They were unified, and they built the wall. In Acts, we read about the church, and it says, when Jesus formed the church, they came together as one. They had all things in common. They weren't uniform, but they were unified. And when the church was unified, thousands of people came to Christ every single day. As a matter of fact, it says in Scripture that this group, this little group of people, turned the world upside down. Why? Because they were unified. It wasn't because they were exceptionally talented in any one way. It was because they worked together as one, and they were able to turn the world upside down. So life becomes more enjoyable you become, as a group, more capable. And then thirdly, the church becomes more focused. It's like the dew of Hermon falling on the mountains of Zion, verse 3. It's like the dew of Hermon falling on the mountains of Zion. Mount Hermon is in the north, and Mount Zion is in the south. And it says the dew falls on both equally. Remember, there was a civil war. The north and the south were fighting against each other. And what this verse of Scripture is saying is is that God's blessing can be applied to both the north and the south. It's available for everyone. These mountains were like 10,000 feet above sea level, some of them. And so the dew would form on the mountains. It would flow down the mountain, and it would uh, be available for the people that were living in the arid deserts below. They only got about 10 inches of rainfall a year, so they were fully dependent upon this the dew coming down the side of the, the mountain dew, by the way. I like that. So the mountain dew was coming down the side of the mountain. They were fully dependent upon the mountain dew for substance, right? But here's the thing. Here's what King David is saying. He's saying, look, dew flows, but it doesn't flow when things are not still and not at rest. See, the people reading this understood what was going on. If there was a windstorm in the mountains, if there was some kind of a storm, that disrupt, anything that disrupted the peace on the mountains, the dew would stop flowing and the people would not have the refreshing, nourishing, life-giving water that they needed to survive. So the only way to have unity, the only way to have blessing is to have unity. And when there's not peace and there's not rest, when there's not shalom and there's not Sabbath, when those things are not going on in your church or in your family or in your organization, when those things are not available, then the blessings stop. They dry up. That life-giving water is no longer available. Hezekiah understood this, and so he invited the northern tribes to come to the Passover festival. Even though they were at war, he invited them to come to the Passover to sit at the table with their brothers and sisters in the south and to sing this song together. Now, not everybody took him up on his offer, but a lot of people from a lot of the tribes that were in the north, they came down for Passover. And he was in charge of the music, and so he added this psalm to the hymn book. And he said, all right, everybody, turn to, turn to hymn number 133. We're going to sing it together. And they began to sing this song, and in this song it brought unity they realized that they were not as strong apart as they were together. So they, they realized they needed to work together and they sing the song and unity happens and blessings begin to flow and Israel got back on track after this moment. All because of unity. And then it says, for there, verse three, for there the Lord has appointed the blessing, life forevermore. Where is the there? For there, there, the Lord, uh, Mount Zion? Is that what it's saying? No, it's saying something greater than that. Where's the there? I want to go to the place of blessing, but I don't know how to get there. Where's the there? (laughs) Good job. (laughs) 
<laughs> the there is the there. The there is Jesus. It's always the right answer. So anytime somebody asks, just shout Jesus and you'll be right 99% of the time. The answer is Jesus. there is Jesus because where is shalom, peace? Only in Jesus. Where is Sabbath, rest? Only in Jesus. And so the there is Jesus. So there is where the Lord appointed the blessing, life forevermore. So life begins with Jesus. Now here's the tough part. When you cause disunity, and when you cause discord, and when you cause disruption in the church, you are stealing the life from other people. That's what the Bible says. When that happens, they don't receive the life. But when there is unity, when you are fighting for love and peace, when you're, you're putting that on, then it, it says that you as the church will be what you were created to be, which is encouraging and life-giving and soul-saving, that's what we were destined to be as the church of Jesus Christ. And if we, find, if we find unity, we'll be able to accomplish that goal. When you fight for unity, when you are humble, when you are trustworthy, when you are determined to bring God's blessing to people, then you will bring that blessing to the people around you. Life will be more enjoyable, the group will be more capable, and the church will be more focused. One last thing about verse 2 that kind of stood out to me said, oil running down Aaron's beard onto his what? Onto his robes. So it ran down his head, it ran down his beard, and then it, it saturated itself on his robes. So guess what? Anywhere that Aaron went, he took that fragrance with him, that unique fragrant, fragrance that only belonged to God. That means everywhere that Aaron went, he brought the blessings of God with him into that place. John chapter 13, verse 34. This is our last scripture. Jesus says, I give you a new command. All right, so we got a new command here coming from Jesus. What's he say? He says, love one another. All right, sounds great. Love one another just as I have loved you. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus said to love one another. I can do that. But and he said to love people the way he loved me. Well, how did Jesus love me? He gave his life for me sacrificed himself for me. He took my sin upon himself and took my sin to the cross. He conquered sin and death by rising from the dead for me. That's the kind of love that Jesus had for me. And now he's telling me this new command that I need to love other people the way that he loved me. And then he tells them the why. He says, by this, everyone, everyone in your community, everyone at the hair salon, everyone at the, at the gas station, everyone at the food line, everyone on the farm, everyone at school, everyone in the church, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's the greatest evangelistic strategy in the world is simply to come together as the church and love one another. Here's what I, I do. I have a mirror in my bathroom like probably a lot of you do. And I look in that mirror sometimes, and now when I look in the mirror, I see a very handsome man. Contrary to what some people might say, I see a very handsome man. But I've noticed over the years, I'm getting a little bit older, see some extra wrinkles, some extra pounds, and so when you, when you see those things, right, you, you, you naturally, your, your mind turns toward, well, the end of your life, Right? And what, 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 what will your legacy be? I like to think about legacy a lot. So I look in the mirror, see the handsome man. Then I see the handsome man getting a little bit older. And then I see the end of my life. And I start to ask myself, what are people going to say about me when I die? What's going to be my legacy? What's going to be on my tombstone? What would I like for that to be? And friends, throughout the years, it's always been the same answer for me. I want it to be said of Kevin Buzzard that when I'm gone, that he was someone that brought people together. That's what I want to be known for. And the reason is because of Jesus' prayer. He prayed three times that the church would be unified the way that he, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are unified. Three different times. And you know what I want to be? I want to be the answer to that prayer. I want to be the answer to Jesus' prayer. And so all, what all of us need to do at some point is to, to look in that mirror and maybe recap the day, think about what we've done and what we should have done and what we shouldn't have done, and ask ourselves this question. 
Did the words that I say today, did the words that I said today, did they bring people together or did they push them apart? Let's pray.